Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, the results of the National Beef Quality Audit, what the lead researchers are saying about the state of our industry and our end product. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen starts now. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. Topping this week's cattle industry news, the just released results of the National Beef Quality Audit. Every five years, the Beef Checkoff funds a nationwide study that looks at the state of our industry and the product we produce. The three-phase checkoff funded program took nearly a year to complete, and now we can confirm our industry is in a state of continuous improvement. And joining me in the studio to share more information on that continuous improvement, Dr. John Patterson, Executive Director of Producer Education for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Dr. Keith Belk, he's one of the lead investigators and from Colorado State University. Dr. Jeff Savel, he's from Texas A&M University and also one of the lead investigators. And finally, Dr. Jason Ahola, one of the lead investigators also from Colorado State University. Gentlemen, thanks for, so much for coming to the show. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, before we get into our conversation, we want to hear from Dr. Tom Field. He's now with the University of Nebraska and was a guiding force as the audit was conducted. Dr. Field says research like this is key to the future of our industry. There are three big things we have to do as an industry. Number one, we must deliver eating satisfaction every single time to our consumer. Secondly, we need to absolutely protect, defend, promote, and enhance the product integrity of beef. In other words, all those composite traits that influence whether a consumer likes the product, trusts the product, and trusts the process that created the product, we must enhance those at every chance we get. And the third active step for us as an industry is, is to very proactively and relentlessly tell the beef story so that people can connect to what it is that we're doing. Well, let's get down to our discussion and Dr. Patterson, I want to start with you. You know, the audit I understand has been cut, conducted every five years since 1991. Why is it that the industry believes this is so important? Well, we believe that you can't make progress unless you can measure where we are or where we have been. Mm -hmm. And so this audit is divided into two phase, into really two major parts. One is we go out and do a lot of measurements in the industry. Mm -hmm. The second part of that is we bring all that data together and then bring in the experts from all phases of the industry and say, guys, here's the data. Help us develop a strategy from the results that, that you've seen uh, present over about a two and a half day. And so once you get that strategy, then you develop a five-year plan on how do we continue to Im make improvement in the beef cattle industry. Very good. I'm anxious to get into some of that data you're referencing. But before we do, there is a lot of good information in, in the audit itself. But tell us, who funds it? How is this project funded every five years? We could have not have accomplished what we've done in this last year without the funding of the beef checkoff. And so this research project comes directly from the checkoff. And Dr. Belk, you've been involved in these in the past, but tell us how your role was maybe a little different this time. Well, Colorado State University is responsible for coordinating phase one of the National Beef Quality Audit, which is the face-to-face -face interviews. Face-to-face mm -hmm. uh, -face interviews of some form or fashion of them have been conducted at each of the National Beef Quality Audits. But for the first time in this 2011 National Beef Quality Audit, we added a uh, economic experiment on mm -hmm. top of the face-to-face -face interviews so that we, when we interviewed various sectors of the industry, which included feeders, packers, retailers, distributors, and wholesalers, and food service companies, mm -hmm. and also government and allied industries, that when we returned with the results, that we could actually quantify mm -hmm. the things that they said that were important. Very good. Well, we'll look forward to learning more about that. And Jeff, tell us a little bit about the role and responsibility of you and your team at Texas A&M. We did the phase, what's known as phase two, which is to go into the plants and actually measure uh, various traits. Mm. And so we went to packing facilities around the country, 
looked at about 18,000 cattle, carcasses, and byproducts on the harvest floor to assess those characteristics. In the cooler, looked at about 9,000 carcasses to look at quality grade, yield grade, and branded programs and other kinds of measures. And then unique this year, we had the opportunity to receive instrument grading information where we were able to have 2.4 million carcasses wow. to evaluate. So uh, quite a good snapshot of what's going on in the industry today. Now, Jason, producers haven't been that involved in this audit in years past. How did that change this year? Yeah, this audit was the first audit to have a phase three, which was a survey of producers to determine how they might influence quality of beef. So we went out and surveyed producers from the seed stock, commercial cow, calf, stocker operating segments, in addition to the dairy segment, to try to quantify how they might influence beef quality. And some of that was asking them, what did quality mean to them? Mm -hmm. And some of it was, how do you feel like you influence quality? We also tried to track how much they participated in beef quality assurance programs. And ultimately what we're trying to do is establish a benchmark to be able to compare results from this audit with future audits. And Jeff, um, you mentioned the number of data points. How does the depth of this year's audit compare to previous? Well, without question, looking at all the information that my colleagues have talked about, plus the addition of the instrument grading. We've got the, the greatest source of information that we have ever have had in any of the quality audits to be able to answer some of the questions that are so key to cattle producers. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for what's shaping up to be a really interesting discussion. And we're not done yet. Next, we'll take a look at how the Chekhov-funded beef quality audit is helping improve results from pasture to plate. We'll be right back. Consumers count on America's cattlemen to deliver quality beef every time. So in your daily work to raise cattle, keep quality top of mind in everything you do, in the care, feeding, and handling of your animals. You can be a part of a national program that provides sound, proven guidelines for beef cattle production that will establish you as a leader and responsible stockman. Beef Quality Assurance, or BQA, is a national program funded by the Beef Checkoff that can help you strengthen your operation, improve cattle care, drive more value to the bottom line, and increase consumer confidence in the quality of America's beef. Producers across the nation have embraced the BQA program because of their commitment to be the world's best producers of beef and because assuring beef quality is our job, not someone else's. Find out how you can become BQA certified. Visit the website bqa.org. They're out there lurking on your pasture just waiting to infect your cattle as they graze. Cattle worms cost you money, but a Safeguard strategic deworming program allows you to deworm your cattle and lower worm burdens on your pasture, resulting in improved pregnancy rates and heavier calf weights. Plus, there's a Safeguard form for every operation. So start killing parasites where they lurk. Talk to your animal health provider today about a Safeguard strategic dewormer program. Safeguard, think strategically, act decisively. No storm is too powerful for New Purina wind and rain storm minerals formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breedback rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. Welcome back. We're talking about the results of the National Beef Quality Audit, and we're here with the experts. Let's return to our discussion. Now, Keith, there are a lot of differences from one end of the beef supply chain to the other, and one of those is the language each one of us uses. Now, how was that manifested in this year's audit? Well, as I mentioned earlier, for the first time, we were able to quantify 
in the phase, phase one of the National Beef Quality Audit, the responses to the face-to-face -face interviews. One of the questions that we asked this time around was how do you define various attributes associated with beef quality? Mm -hmm. And we sort of divided that up into seven categories of quality, if you will. Uh, we had food safety, we had beef eating satisfaction, mm -hmm. how and where the cattle were raised, mm -hmm. lean fat and bone or carcass composition, uh, weight and size, genetics, and then visual characteristics. Mm -hmm. And these, these buckets of quality categories, uh, they applied regardless of whether you were a cattle feeder or you were a retailer or a food service operator. Uh, you could define these categories however you wanted. And what we found is that some of the definitions for those categories were vastly different from mm. each other. And so, for example, uh, the category, the quality category, how and where the cattle were raised, we had extremely different answers depending mm -hmm. on whether you were a cattle feeder versus a retailer versus a food service operator versus a packer. Mm -hmm. And so that was where some of the disparity in definitions associated with beef quality came in. Well, does that really matter? I think it's important because it indicates to us that there is a discontinuity in how we communicate up and down the supply chain of the beef industry. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, as you move closer to the consumers, then things that were more important to retailers and food service operators were sort of social type of issues, animal mm -hmm. well-being, mm -hmm. those types of topics. As you move, work back upstream in the, in the, the supply chain, uh, cattle feeders, for example, uh, I think things like uh, vaccination, health, health history, health management practices were more mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. and so that things change depending on where you were in the supply chain. And that indicates to us that there's a difference in the economic signals that perhaps are being passed up and down the chain. Mm. Uh, for example, when it comes to carcass weight, we know that carcass weight has continued to increase for the last hundred years, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any consumers that are going into grocery stores and asking the grocery uh, merchandiser to provide bigger steaks for them. So mm. the economic signal for larger cattle is not coming probably from consumers. Mm. And so you have to wonder where is that being introduced into the marketing chain? Because there certainly is uh, an economic signal for cattle producers to sure. raise bigger cattle. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Jeff, tell us about the findings about quality from a packing plant perspective. Well, one of the things I want to share with you and with the audience is the level of bruising that we found this, this time. In 2005, in the quality audit, we had 64.8% of the carcasses that had no bruises. Mm. This year, in 2011, it was to 77%, so a great increase in the number of cattle without bruises. And I think it's a tribute to the work that the cattle producers are doing and all the attention that's been paid to animal handling and mm. trucking and and offloading and things like that that are making a big difference in the, in the number of bruises that cattle have today. That's great news. Good. Jason, you told us that you engage producers in a new and unique way in this year's audit. How do they perceive quality? Yeah, we asked them when you heard, hear the term quality uh, relative to the beef industry, what does that mean to you? And uh, the two answers that came to the top were um, raising cattle and calves that are healthy and also producing beef that is safe and wholesome. Mm. So it's pretty clear that producers equate these two concepts with quality. Uh, and, and up until this point, we really didn't have a great idea of what they thought quality was. So do producers believe they can make a difference in terms of quality? Yeah, we actually asked them uh, further, how do you think you influence quality? And 96% of them said uh, that they actively do something on their farm or ranch to influence quality. And the number one reason was preventative health care, such as vaccines, as a way of trying to proactively uh, uh, influence quality in the beef chain. And we also found out that nine out of 10 producers that responded to the survey have a relationship with their veterinarian related to the use of animal health products. We call that a veterinary client patient relationship as a technical term, but it's a great way to make sure you are properly using preventative health care and also properly using 
health treatments for animals that might be sick. So a lot of producers are being very proactive with health care as it impacts quality. So Jason, can the quality improvements we see at the packing plant be attributed to the improvements that producers have made? Yeah, I think we could actually give quite a bit of credit to uh, the Beef Quality Assurance Program for some of the improvements. One of the examples would be injection site lesions. Mm. And uh, what we found in our survey was that currently 87% uh, of producers choose to give an injection in the neck region, front of the shoulder of an animal, mm. versus historically it tended to be in the rear of an animal and devalued some cuts. And we also found that 84% of producers would prefer using a subcutaneous method under the skin rather than intramuscular. Again, uh, trying to avoid causing injection site lesions. So some really big improvements on injection sites that we can truly say producers have changed the way they're doing things. That is encouraging. So just how widespread is BQA? Well, that is one of the questions we directly asked. We said, uh, have you ever been to a meeting that uh, talked about how to reduce quality defects? Uh, and 78% uh, of, of producers said that they had attended such a meeting. Mm -hmm. And then we asked, have you ever heard of beef quality assurance? And 87% of producers uh, indicated that they had heard mm -hmm. of that. Uh, we asked those, just the people that's responded yes to that question, uh, have you ever gone through a beef quality assurance training uh, uh, meeting? And 71% said that. So ultimately, of all the people that took our survey, 43% were Beef Quality Assurance certified. So that's a huge uh, number of producers out in the country. Dr. Patterson, you and your team at NCBA lead the checkoff funded BQA program. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested, how have you been able to make this uh, information on animal handling uh, techniques so available to so many people around the country? And, and what impact has it had? Well, it's, it's had a great impact of what you don't see in the audit now, uh, injection site blemishes, mm -hmm. bruises, those kinds of issues. How did we get that accomplished? We got that accomplished by going through our state BQA coordinators, mm -hmm. their educators, the state beef councils, their educators, the state cattlemen's organizations, mm -hmm. uh, the guys that are, are the state beef specialists. They all teach proper BQA uh, protocols and procedures. In addition to that, we've got a great communications team that uh, puts that, the information out nationally, as well as uh, beginning to use things like Facebook and uh, webinars. So we've, we think we've got a good communications uh, program to get this information out. And you can get more information on the Beef Quality Audit by visiting bqa.org. We're so excited to be bringing the results of the National Beef Quality Audit to our audience. Our discussion continues right after this. Preventing cattle pink eye is as easy as one, two, three. One, vaccinate your animals with Pilligard Pink Eye Triview to provide pink eye fighting antibodies in the tears that bathe the eye. Broad spectrum protection that cross reacts with 103 different strains of pink eye causing bacteria. Two, stop the flies that spread pink eye bacteria throughout the herd. Apply double barrel VP ear tags and Ultra Boss Pour On for up to five months of face fly and horn fly control. Three, manage the environment to reduce damage to the animal's eye from seed heads, pollen, and UV light, irritants that increase the risk of pink eye infection. With the right tools, preventing pink eye is as easy as one, two, three. cost forage and improve grazing access by clearing out weeds and brush with these Dow AgroSciences herbicides. See your Dow AgroSciences representative or visit rangeandpasture.com. There's something wrong. His head is down. He's clearly stressed. He's worried sick about BRD. That's why there's prescription Zactran for BRD treatment and control in high-risk cattle. 
Get a rapid response plus 10-day treatment and control in a single dose so you can stop worrying and get back to business. For use in cattle only, do not treat cattle within 35 days of slaughter. Because a discard time in milk has not been established, do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older or in calves to be processed for veal. The effects of Zactran on bovine reproductive performance, pregnancy, and lactation have not been determined. Don't worry yourself sick. Talk to your veterinarian about a real alternative for BRD treatment and control. Because it's critical, it's Zactran. From Marielle, a leading animal health company. Welcome back to this very special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We're with the lead investigators of this year's beef quality audit and we're talking about the results. Keith, I want to begin this segment with you and talk specifically about those face to face interviews you did. After all those interviews, what are some of the key findings? We performed a procedure in, in this national beef quality audit that's referred to as best worst scaling. Hmm. And best worst scaling is just a technique where you can prioritize or arrange in terms of priority a long list of attributes. Mm. And so we did that with everybody that we interviewed in, in phase one. And what we learned across all of the sectors of the industry that food safety and eating satisfaction were the most important mm. uh, criteria for quality that people expect in, in, in the beef supply chain. And so they became extremely important. The interesting thing about both of those quality categories is that when we asked the interviewees what were the strengths and the weaknesses of the beef industry, industry currently, uh, they listed both of those categories as both a strength and mm. as a weakness. And so what we think is that we've made progress in both food safety and eating satisfaction, mm. but we need to continue that progress because they're still such important demand drivers for the industry. Well, let's talk about eating satisfaction. Um, what do they tell you in terms of the, uh, the components that make up eating satisfaction, in their opinion? It was actually quite interesting. Um, when we asked them to define what the, the term eating satisfaction meant to them, uh, of course, by far and away, most of the companies that were interviewed said, well, tenderness and taste is most important. But interestingly enough, for the first time, uh, those sectors of the industry that are closest to the consumer, mm -hmm. so the food service portion of the industry and the retailers, they said that now flavor is the most important criteria for eating satisfaction. Mm. And so as we move forward, uh, we need to not forget the importance of flavor and taste to the industry. Very interesting. Jeff, what other quality improvements did you find? Well, it's interesting in our phase two information when we looked at the, the amount of quality grading and the different grades, we found that the percent prime and choice was the highest it's been in, uh, during the history of the quality audits. In fact, it was 61.1% this year compared to five years ago then in the 2005 audit, we, it was 54.5%. So a pretty dramatic increase in percent choice and prime. The other thing that's interesting is how many of those carcasses really fit the target? And when we identify or when we've asked people to identify what's the target to them, they'll say it's, you know, what percent of them are prime, choice, select, yield grades one, two, and three. And so we went from 81.7% all the way up to 85.1%. So greater number of them are fitting the targets for the industry from quality, but even greater number of them are fitting for both quality and composition. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, the industry has, has really just implemented instrument grading since the last quality audit. And so what did this year's uh, BQA audit tell us about the implementation of instrument grading? Well, you remember at the beginning uh, stated that we had uh, carcass measures for like 8,000 carcasses actually in the plant, mm -hmm. but then we have 2.4 million observations from the instruments that are used in the, in the, also in the plants. And what we found was how close those measurements were in the uh, yield grade and the marbling score and the rib eye area, how close they were, they were almost interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Which to, to our team 
we feel like that that gives us great confidence that either system uh, works well to identify the quality and uh, yield characteristics that are so important to the beef industry. Now, Jason, Keith talked a lot about food safety as well. What role do producers play in food safety? Well, one of the things we found out is the importance of low-stress cattle handling to producers. There's a lot of evidence out there that low-stress cattle handling is conducive to produ production of high-quality beef. And cattle producers told us basically the same thing uh, in terms of what they feel uh, their methods are for influencing the quality of beef. As we talked earlier, one of them is producing healthy cattle. Uh, the other one was uh, the use of low-stress animal handling and stockmanship skills. And so uh, producers uh, were basically uh, saying to us it's, it's very important to them to, uh, to influence quality by, by using some of these new techniques. Uh, we also asked them when they're working cattle or processing cattle, mm -hmm. uh, do they use an uh, electric prod as their primary driving tool? And over 98% of producers said that they did not. Mm -hmm. So there's very, very little uh, use of electric prods and, and producers are really focused on uh, low-stress cattle handling techniques. And is this an improvement? Uh, that's a good question because we have not asked this of producers before and there's really no data from historical records, mm -hmm. um, but low-stress cattle handling has become a mainstay of beef quality assurance training mm -hmm. and uh, we would only assume that that has improved over time. Jeff, after all the extensive data you've collected at the packing plant level and, and all your experience, I mean, was there one thing that kind of surprised you? Well, one of the things that we, we found that was so important to us, or we felt like was important, was the, the number of cattle that came to the plant with some sort of identification. Mm. And we found that we had uh, over 97% of the carcasses or the cattle coming in that had some form of identification. But what's unique this year compared to the previous time was the number of them that had true individual information. And in fact, in 2005, we had 3.5% of the cattle had electronic ear tags. Mm -hmm. This time we had 20.1%. Mm. And then if you take the individual visual tags, just the normal tags that have individual numbers, that number increased from 38.7% all the way to 50.6%. And if you do that combination, we're going from roughly about 40% of the animal animals with a, you know really good individual identification all the way up to 70%. Mm. What would you suspect is driving that kind of increase? We feel like the, the demand for age and source verified uh, cattle, the, the marketplace is demanding more knowledge about where the animals have come from to meet various uh, requirements, export requirements uh, for Japan and places like this. And so really if you look, the, the domestic and foreign markets are demanding more knowledge about where the cattle are coming from. And I think it, we see it reflected mm -hmm. in the number of, of cattle that are coming through the system that have individual identification. Dr. Hola, that, that information, I guess, would indicate that our industry has a pretty good start on identification. Uh, uh, did you find the same thing in, in your section of the audit? Yeah, we asked producers if they use individual animal identification to track animals' uh, withdrawal time for a pharmaceutical product use, and we found 78% uh, of producers do, in fact, use individual identification for that purpose. And uh, I think we would all agree that individual identification of an animal, such as an ear tag, is a great start in terms of record keeping and trying to track and document more information about cattle. That's really encouraging news. So what does all this mean for the consumer? That's next on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Assuring beef quality begins with dedicated people such as Phoebe Bittler, a dairy producer, and Jim Warren, a cattle auction market owner. Both are winners of the Beef Checkoff funded National Beef Quality Assurance Award and both recognize the need for the entire industry to focus on beef quality. We've tried to put our best foot forward and try to see that um, the product that we send out of this country is the most wholesome, safest, best product that anybody could have anywhere. 
and to be um, complimented for that effort is a, an amazing experience. It's all important and I think there's some really good protocols laid out in the uh, Beef Quality Assurance Program that will help producers to do the best job that they can do. Producers across the nation have embraced the BQA program because they're committed to producing the world's best beef. To find out how you can compete for the BQA National Awards, visit the website bqa.org. When it comes to versatility on your operation, nothing beats a John Deere D-Series skid steer. They're not only great for cleaning and feed chores, but with John Deere Worksite Pro attachments, you can tackle just about any job thrown your way. You asked for versatility, and John Deere delivered. These rock-solid machines are built to last. See your dealer today. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattlemen provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Welcome back to this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Let's return to the discussion with the lead investigators of the National Beef Quality Audit. Dr. Belk, we've been talking about what consumers are looking for in their beef, and we know that they want to feed their families a safe product and they want a great tasting product, uh, but consumers are changing. I mean, what else uh, did you learn from this audit about what they're looking for in, in the beef that they, they purchase? Actually, that's very interesting. As I mentioned earlier, we had a chance to ask some of our interview questions that were sort of open-ended. Mm -hmm. And so we asked about strengths and we asked about weaknesses in the beef industry. And then we were able, because of how we did this, to quantify those responses. And one of the things that we found across the board, so regardless of which sector of the industry we're talking about, is that two things showed up on our radar in a big way. One of those is that we need to be more transparent hmm. in how we produce and how we market and how we uh, generate beef from cattle. Hmm. And the other is, is we need to do a better job of proactively telling our story hmm. to the general public. Uh, an awful lot of folks hmm. um, are several generations removed now from any sort of agricultural production. And as a consequence of that, um, we just need to do a better job of helping them understand what we do every day, uh, how we produce the safe and high mm. quality beef that, we, that they have access to in their, their local stores. And, and did the different segments express different opinions about that or what did you learn there? In this case, I think uh, all of the sectors expressed the same opinion about this, that we need to do a better job of proactively telling our story. So if we're going to do that, Jason, I mean, what role do producers play in, in, in helping consumers understand more about that, providing that information? Yeah, well, producers, uh, based on our survey, are doing a lot of things to intentionally influence quality. Like we said, animal health practices, low stress handling. Unfortunately, cattle producers traditionally have not done a great job of documenting that or uh, providing information beyond their segment in terms of what's been done. So I think this is a great opportunity for beef producers at any segment to uh, begin to document, record keep, and, and, uh, and identify the specific things that they're doing to their cattle uh, throughout their, their, the time that they're on their operations and passing that down the chain. So Jeff, let me ask you a question. I mean, do you think this, uh, this BQA audit uh, provides a platform to, to tell at least part of that beef story? Well, the interesting thing about the National Beef Quality Audit, because we have so many of the various sectors of the beef industry that, that are evaluated or, or uh, measured or, or information from, 
everybody gets to learn more about uh, another sector than their own. And so for, you know, every five years, you kind of open up everybody's window of what are they doing. And so people further down the line have a better understanding of what's happening more at the production end. And those that are in the production sector get to learn more about the retail and food service sectors and find out some of their, their concern. And I, I think it gives, uh, it gives the beef industry a great chance to understand more of what it takes to, to produce beef all the way to the consumer. But everybody knows more about what everybody else's part of that is. And I think that that's been a big part of the findings we have. It's not what the findings are, it's the fact that you can share this and people have a, a better, truer understanding of you know the people before them and the people after them. Jeff, I want to go back to, to one of the specific data points you collected from a carcass standpoint. And, and uh, obviously we've all heard that carcass weights continue to rise in our industry. Can you tell us more about what you learned about that in, in this quality audit? Well, uh, it, just as you said, uh, it's no surprise that carcass weights are up. In fact, they're up about 30 pounds uh, from 2005, and they're around 825 pounds uh, for an average. The range, if you look at the, those carcasses, it would be between 600 and 1,000 pounds. About 95% of them fit within that, but we have some outliers that are below that and outliers that are above. But uh, constantly, every time we measure carcass weight, it just keeps getting heavier. And, and what kind of challenges does that present, or does it? Well, uh, when, we, when we get feedback from the food service and retail sectors, the, they've been telling us for years that the carcasses are too big or the cuts are too big and things like that. And you know, it's a challenge because you think about this, in the retail sector, the retailers are selling product by the pound. And so you have to have a certain size product that goes to the consumer and it's priced by the pound, so that's a challenge. In food service, those products are sold on a portion weight basis. So 12 ounce, six ounce, whatever it may be. So as we increase, as the beef industry increases weights, then that, that continues you know, to be a challenge to them. Now, over time, we've seen innovative merchandising uh, things that have come about that are trying to you know, adapt and, and we see a whole different way that beef is merchandised today than five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 or even more than that to try to, to uh, reflect this. But it continues to be uh, a message that we hear from the end user is that these cuts keep getting bigger. Now what do we do with them? Yeah, interesting. John, what does that mean and what kind of impact does that have on BQA program itself? I think it's going to be huge over the next five years. And one of the guidance that we received from the strategy team was to do a better job telling our story. Uh -huh. Well, that's not just to the consumer. That's a story that has to go all the way up and down the line talking to uh, producers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think we've got our directions. What you you're hearing here today, tonight is an overview, a 30,000 foot view of, of the beef industry. What you have not heard yet is the specifics on, specifically what does a retailer say, specifically what does a feeder say. We're going to give you that information over the next year. Every month we're going to have a, a specific fact sheet. We're going to drill down into this data. There's a huge amount of data here that these guys have collected that we want to share with, uh, with our industry to let them look specifically at some of these challenges. And I suspect there are some differences as you get to different segments of the chain is what's most important to them, right? And well, I think when we started this conversation tonight, we asked, what is the definition of quality? Mm -hmm. And quality in the pre-harvest side oftentimes is different than in the post-harvest side. So we've got to somehow come together and, and have a, a more uniform idea of quality because we do not want to confuse the consumer out yeah, there. That's a good point. And I want to follow up that, uh, that quality conversation with Keith. You mentioned early on in the program seven quality categories. So, so based on the research, as you think about how people purchase calves and feeder calves and, and fed cattle and beef, what is the number one quality category? Well, as a component of this phase one, and we've never done this before, I mentioned earlier that we conducted an economic experiment. We sort of superimposed it over the interview process. This economic experiment allows us to make some computations that have mm -hmm. never been available before. One of those are what are the probabilities or what are the odds that a, very, a, a company that's in the beef supply chain would require, absolutely require a certain quality attribute before they would make the purchase. 
Okay. The second thing that we were able to compete was, well, if they didn't require something, then if we provided this quality attribute, would they be willing to make, pay more for it? So we have that information available. But when we made the computations for the odds of what was most likely to be the quality attribute that would be required before they would make a purchase up and down the supply chain, it was where, how and where the cattle were raised. Mm. So interestingly, what that tells us is that everybody in the marketing chain wants more information to be associated with whatever they're buying. And that's different. I already told you earlier that that's different depending on which sector of the industry mm -hmm. you're in. So for example, feeders, they want to know more about the health management plans that calves that they're buying were under. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you get downstream to uh, retailers and food service operators, they want to know more about the animal welfare, the animal mm -hmm. well-being. How were the animals treated? Mm -hmm. um, where were they raised? Um, and those sorts of things. Were they raised sustainably? Mm -hmm. And those are all important attributes that we could attach to the cattle as they move through the supply chain, but they're different pieces of information at each market sector. So John, is providing this information just the responsibility of the producer? or should all segments be involved in providing this kind of information to consumers? Our producers are independent minded and they always have been, but are we total quality management oriented? And if we are, then everybody has to be involved in making sure we provide a quality product. If that packing plant has an injection site blemish, they want to know where that came from and let's get rid of that, let's stop that. And that's the good news in this audit because that's just about gone away. But if on the other hand, that retailer is saying the consumer wants to know how and where these cattle were produced, that has got to go all the way back down the chain. Somebody has got to communicate that information. So it's not just a producer issue. It's everybody in the chain has got to be committed to total quality management in this industry. That's a great suggestion. Gentlemen, thank you for these insights you've been providing. We'll be back with some final thoughts right after this. Stay with us. When predicting the genetic merit of young Angus cattle, some genomic tests only give you part of the story. For the most complete and dependable evaluation of genetic potential, with more markers and coverage for economically important traits, there's only one genomic test that won't leave Angus breeders in the dark. Ever wonder where the beef checkoff dollar goes and what it buys? The Federation of State Beef Councils is made up of the 45 qualified state beef councils that collect the $1 per head beef checkoff. Each council keeps control of 50 cents and sends 50 cents to the Cattlemen's Beef Board for use in national beef checkoff programs. Many states also choose to send a portion of their share to the Federation to expand national and international efforts. As a division of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the Federation of State Beef Councils works to support an effective state and national partnership, helping to increase beef demand through research, promotion, and education. Because producers themselves direct these programs, your beef checkoff dollars are in good hands. Learn more about the Federation of State Beef Councils by visiting beefusa.org. Hi there, I'm Dr. Dan Thompson from Doc Talk. Each week on Doc Talk, we'll be discussing important issues such as livestock management and welfare, important and new agricultural research, and how to keep our food supply safe. My guests will include nationally and internationally known veterinarians and animal scientists. So if you farm, ranch, or eat, you'll find something of interest in every single episode. Watch Doc Talk every Monday on RFD TV at 4.30 p.m. or online at DocTalkTV.com. There are two things you need to know about Sweet Licks. Number one, they offer a complete line of vitamin, mineral, protein, and medicated nutritional supplements. And number two, they're available in a variety of forms and sizes. What you need, how you need it. For your nearest dealer, just pick up your cone and call 187-SWEET-LICKS. That's with an X. Profitability never tasted so sweet. 
We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. I've been to Canada many times. It's full of cowboys and farmers and families like us. They're known for many grand things like the Royal Canadian Mounties, their timber and oil, and the Hudson Bay. But they are renowned for their tolerance, their political correctness, and their deference to others, often, it seems to me, to their own detriment. The scene was the annual stock dog trials at Maple Creek, Saskatchewan. All the sheep men for miles had come for the trials and brought a dog they would match you on. And then a stranger pulled up to the fence. New meat, the locals were hoping. In the back of his truck, he drug out old Tuck and entered him up in the open. Well, the open was after the novice. The good dogs all put on a show. They were reaching and stretching and lifting and fetching and giving each other a go. And then last but not least came old Tuck. And he did right well till the end. And he would have done better if he'd quit when he shed her. But he ate the last few that he penned. I mean, right there in front of the judge. Just like a boa constrictor. He looked happy indeed as he spit out a seed. Sheep have little seeds. You see them scattered all over the ground where sheep are. And savored the spoils of the victor. Disqualified, screamed the contestants. Their objections were loud and profane. Tuck watched all the while with his landlord smile, while his master begged time to explain. I say that we took as offended with this indiscriminate zeal. I regret his bad taste, but no one's disgraced. So I ate an old year. No big deal. Lord knows I've tried to teach him good manners, but you got to admit that old sheep was tough as a shoe, dying hard to chew. The talk never complained, not a peep. I'm sorry he partook, you poor darling. He did only what he thought was right. From tail to head, he's Canadian bred. He ate her to just be polite. This is Baxter Black and Sweetie from out there. Welcome back as we wrap up this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, before we go, we wanted to get some final thoughts from the experts about what's next on the National Beef Quality Audit. And Jason, let's start with you. Yeah, I wanted to recognize uh, the fact that many of the improvements I think we've seen in this audit versus the one in, in 1991 in the last 20 years, I think can be credited to the National uh, Beef Quality Assurance Program. Mm -hmm. And it's been around for longer than 1991. And uh, we saw in this audit uh, surveys from producers saying health is important, cattle handling is important, and those are fundamental aspects of, of the Beef Quality Assurance Program. So uh, to think moving forward how much we could accomplish, uh, especially in the past, we've been funded on a very limited shoestring budget. I think if we could fund this program fully, it could be amazing. Jeff, what would you add? Well, each year, each time we do the National Beef Quality Audit, you bring together this whole group of people that usually are, are not fully aligned. So you cattle producers and feeders and packers and retailers and food service. And, and now you have a chance to share information and for people to learn more about what the other group does. And I think the findings are, are, are almost uh, less important than it is the fact that you got people talking and you got people talking about the importance of the quality audit and what's the information and using uh, any of the findings from one sector to the next. I think it's been a very important part of what we do. Very good. Keith, what would you add? One of our most important objectives, I believe, is to identify ways that we can improve demand for beef and therefore improve profitability for all sectors of the beef industry. Mm -hmm. And I think we've once again done that by identifying food safety and eating satisfaction as hugely important demand drivers. Mm -hmm. now, we just need to go out and all of us be more proactive in terms of telling the story of how we produce beef to the general public. And John, what would you add? 
Well, this project would not have occurred without the support of the Beef Checkoff, and so we really need to thank them for doing that. We have our marching orders now. Mm -hmm. The marching orders are guys do not give an inch when it comes to product integrity, mm -hmm. eating satisfaction, and above all, you got to tell your story. And that starts with a seed stock and goes all the way to the consumer. So those are our marching orders for the next five years. Very good. Thank you all again for sharing your insights today. For more information about the National Beef Quality Audit funded by the Beef Checkoff, just visit our website at bqa.org. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Join us right back here next week on RFD TV.